congratulations on the book. It's fantastic. Um, now, what has been the... Oh, it's not out yet. That's one thing. But what is the basic premise of the book for people who don't know? I want to remind people in the West how important it is that we don't take for granted what we have. And more importantly even than that, to remind them that if we do take for granted what we have, we have enemies who will take advantage of that. Yeah, I wonder who you're thinking of in particular. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it is, a, you know, it's a, I haven't read a book like it. It is, you know, you, you're coming from the outside and you're saying, this place is great. Why mm -hmm. are you trying to do it down all the time? Why? Why are we doing that? When study after study says that we're not this big racist fascist country, why do the people who live here want to see it fail? Well, I think this version of progressivism, which I think is what you're referring to, is kind of like gout. It's a disease of prosperity. We're, we're very fortunate in the West, and I think we feel guilty about it. We've been made to feel guilty about it. And because of that, we've imbibed this idea that we are the worst people ever. And it concerns me deeply, Andrew, because the, the question for me is, if you think you're a bad person, if you think you're a bad country, why would you ever defend yourself? Why would you defend your society? And we've seen in recent months, of course, that we do have enemies. People in the West have forgotten this very obvious thing, that not everybody everywhere in the world thinks as we do, not everybody in the world wants what we do, not everybody has the same methods as we do. And if we allow ourselves to become disillusioned with our own vision of life, then people will come and take over who do have a strong vision of what society should look like. And you talk in the book a lot about your background, mm. but not just your background, your family's background and your grandparents' background. That was really interesting as well. So, you know, what sort of life did they have? in the Soviet system? Well, my grandmother was born in a gulag in a Soviet concentration camp. Uh, and many of the things that we're now seeing in society, I wouldn't compare them to the Stalinist period, but we are seeing things like you talked about earlier in the program, the singer Macy Gray, uh, yeah. what, what happened with her. To me, it's very reminiscent of late Soviet society in which I grew up, where yeah. people would be uh, forced to go back on an opinion they'd expressed and they would come out with the sort of you know, I comrade Kishin, and then make a, a long apology which reversed the position they expressed two minutes ago. Yes. And when I see someone like Macy Gray making a strong statement, and it doesn't really matter what your view of that particular issue is, just the very fact that we now live in a society where people can be bullied into lying in public having made a statement like that, I think we should all be very worried about that, that. That's one of the criticisms that people will have, is that they'll say, well, you know, there's a difference between Macy Gray appearing on two TV shows and reversing her position and someone being in Maoist China at a struggle session. Mm. You know, we're not quite at the gulag stage yet. What would you say to that? Well, I don't think we are at the gulag stage, but what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make is we are in the late Soviet stage. We absolutely are in the late. My grandfather made a statement about the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan mm. and was made unemployable mm. and eventually had to leave. Is that that different to what we have in modern Britain? So why is it we can't see that? When, you know, when people deride cancel culture, they say, well, cancel culture was just invented by the right. All it is is we're holding people accountable for their bad views. Isn't that OK? Well, cancel culture has been around for, for millennia, and we, we both know that. But the, the question is, do we want to have that sort of society? And it strikes me as, as, as that, it strikes me that we're embracing ideologies which are very hostile and alien to the very idea of the Western project, the, like the ones that I come from. Uh, and I was doing a bit of research for a talk I gave recently, and one of the things I came across is a guy called George Kennan. He was... Uh, an American diplomat and the architect of the containment policy against the Soviet Union. And one of the things he said is that the greatest threat to us in the West is that we begin to embrace the ideas of our opponents, the ideas of our enemies. And I'm afraid it seems to me that we're doing that now. Is there anything about the West you do dislike? Uh, the food. Yeah, I can see that. That's fair enough. But, I mean, you, you came here from when you were 13. And mm. what I didn't know, actually, and you said in the book that you didn't speak the language. And, and so you were thrown in here... And, you, and, and does it take that kind of outsider's perspective to sort of appreciate what you've got? I hope not. I hope that actually people can read the book and see for themselves through my eyes what I see here in the West. And it's just about context, Andrew. This is the thing, I, you know, you know that I talk about slavery in the book, for example, and I'm deeply troubled not by the fact that we teach about slavery, but how little we teach about that issue. Uh, we teach about the transatlantic slave trade briefly, but we don't actually cover the fact that this is some, a practice that has been around for thousands of years. Human beings were the first good that was actually ever traded. And you have to understand the context of things in order to understand your own historical role. So I'm in favor of teaching more history, not less, so that we can understand ourselves from a different a set of different perspectives. I think that's really important. Because you mentioned in the book you have relative 
relatives who were yeah. slaves. Well, my grandfather was taken as a slave laborer to Germany. And of course, when I say my grandmother was born in the Gulag, that means her parents were both in the Gulag. Right. And they were kept there because they were useful to the project of building whatever the, they so, were building. So when you talk about all these Gulags and everything, and I've seen a lot of revisionism, do you remember at Goldsmiths, those students were saying that the Gulags were fine, they were like holiday camps where you could join theatre clubs and and this kind of thing. But even that in itself, that revision of history, mm. that's a very kind of Soviet idea. That's something that's creeping in more and more here. Does it trouble you when you see people wanting statues to be torn down, streets to be renamed, that kind of thing? It troubles me only in the sense that I'm a Democrat. I believe those things should happen on a democratic basis. Right. If the people of a city want to remove a statue and they vote to do that, I'm fine with that. It's up to the people. Uh, I'm against mobs coming around and te tearing things down. But, you know, also in the book, as you know, I talk about the origins of political correctness. Yeah. You know, you and I both get lumped into this sort of, like, political correctness gone mad crowd, which neither of us is. But actually, most people don't know where political correctness comes from, and I do think it's quite important that they do. It comes from the Soviet Union, and people like my ancestors would be told, well, comrade, this is factually correct, but it is politically incorrect. And what that meant was, what you're saying is not in line with the party dogma. Well, that's like, what is a woman? Well, it's like what, we're, what we've yeah. got now. This is my point. Yeah, that, I mean, that's troubling. You also in the book talk a lot about this idea of uh, why we don't trust the media, mm. why we don't trust figures in authority. Uh, and could you talk to us a little bit about that and your ideas around this? Because, you know, again and again, I'm running into this, that, 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 that people just don't trust anyone anymore because they keep being lied to. Well, <laughs> you've said it there. Okay. It's not that complicated. I no, mean, I know, if you but... keep lying to people, they will stop trusting you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> surprisingly. And, and, I, and I think it's really important, actually, that the media realise their role in their own demise. Uh, we've seen it also in the comedy industry. The comedy industry approached the idea of booking people based not on their skills and talents, but on their skin colour and sexuality, and it's now destroying itself. Fewer people are watching the mainstream comedy shows, yeah. and it's the same with the media. If you keep lying to people, if you keep saying things that aren't true, if you keep calling them names for having perfectly reasonable opinions, eventually they will start switching off. Now that you mentioned the comedy industry, because one of the things you also talk about in the book is your experience, mm. which did become quite well known at the time, which was when you refused to sign a form saying that you would not talk about certain things on stage. Mm. And for people who are watching who may not know about that, although it did go pretty global, mm. didn't it? What, what happened there? Well, what happened was they, uh, I was uh, asked to do a gig for charity at SOAS, uh, and they sent me a contract which said that uh, uh, they had a zero tolerance policy on racism, sexism, classism, ageism, ableism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, xenophobia, Islamophobia, anti-religion and anti-atheism. And it also said that all jokes must be respectful and kind. Right. Uh, uh, and I don't think you've remembered all of those. Well, I've repeated it quite a few times <laughs> at this point, I'll be honest with you. But when I turned it down, that was actually an eye-opening moment for me because I think up until that point, I sort of thought that me and you were these weird sort of free speech people and, and people in the country don't really necessarily care about this issue. Yeah. But what I found was here was an unknown comedian turning down an unpaid gig from some two-bit university, and it was the second biggest story on the BBC yeah. on the day that Theresa May, the then Prime Minister, was nearly removed from office by her own party. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Quite sig now, we didn't know at the time that the Tory party would keep removing its leaders every couple of years. <laughs> right. but, but at the time, it was a hugely significant moment, and what I think I realised at the point, or certainly thought at, the po at that point, was that... Actually, a lot of people in the country feel that they can't say what they think. They didn't care about me or my story. They cared about the feeling that they have themselves, that they can't really say what they think for fear of punishment. And the polling shows this. I talk about this in the book, as you know. More than half of people in Britain are now fearful more than they used to be of saying what they think. And in America, two-thirds of people are afraid to express their political, opinion, their political yeah. opinions in public. So we're in a bad place. But it's funny because, you know, I, obviously I've been on your podcast right from the start and mm. I've watched a lot of what you do and it's always so moderate and sensible and, 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 and not at all reactionary and, you know, uh, you, don't, you don't have sort of rabid frothing at the mouth mm. and all this sort of stuff. But that's how you are often caricatured, right? And I think I ha am as well. Mm. Yeah, particularly by the comedy industry, mm. I think. So w why is that happening when people can just say sensible things that, as you say, a lot of the public agree with, and yet all of a sudden we're evil. Well, you reminded me before we started that we're before the watershed, so I won't tell you what I actually think. But <laughs> I, I think their ideas are not very good, uh, and therefore it's helpful to dismiss people like us instead of having to actually engage with what we're saying. I, I, it's, I, is that that simple? I do think it's that simple, and also a lot of comedians are idiots. I mean, yeah, I don't want to say that, but, yeah, no, they, you're absolutely right. <laughs> um, uh, but you, you've moved away from the comedy industry more and more. You haven't done stand-up for a mm. while. Do you think you'd ever go back to it? 
Uh, I may. I, I've sort of taken a break, and if it lasts the rest of my life, then I, I'll be content with that. But it might not. I'm, I'm just... I've got better things to do at the moment. Just to go back to the book quickly, because mm. we've got a little bit of time, um, you make this really interesting uh, point towards the end of the book where you're talking about how the implication of saying that the West is terrible, this is a horrible country, and saying this to people who are immigrants like mm. yourself and saying, you know, you, you need to be aware of how awful this is, that there's a kind of insinuation that maybe you should leave. Mm. <laughs> what it's do you a, mean by well, that? Well, it's a tongue-in-cheek comment, sure. and what I'm really saying is, you know, we see a lot of these sort of racial justice activists or whatever on TV talking about how this is the worst country in the world, but I never see them move anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed that? Yeah, exactly. And it sort of makes me think that maybe they don't really believe it and instead they're just saying it because it helps their career. Imagine that. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about where people can buy the book and what it's called and all the rest of it, just to re-emphasize. Well, the book yeah. is available to pre-order on Amazon. It's out on Thursday. But if you want to get a signed copy, apparently my signature devalues the book. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So if you go to my Twitter, my pinned tweet is actually you can buy it from a local bookshop. I was really keen that you'd be able to do that. And they will sell you a cheaper copy, and I will sign it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Can't say fairer than that. Constantine Kissing, everyone.